first we're going to look at hypnosis. Um, not a whole lot that you guys really have to know about hypnosis, but just remember hypnosis is just a procedure that opens people up to the power of suggestion. Um, the idea is once a subject is in an altered state during hypnosis, they might act, perceive, think, or feel according to the hypnotist's suggestion. So um, not probably a huge deal on the test, but something that we should just kind of cruise over. Um, Post-hypnotic amnesia would be the inability to recall what you've experienced during hypnosis. Um, Post-hypnotic suggestion would be a suggestion that's made during hypnosis, but you're supposed to actually carry out that suggestion after you're outside of your hypnotized state. So it can be used for certain things like eating less and quitting smoking and feeling less anxiety. Um, again, when we talk about hypnosis, you know, people can be hypnotized kind of at, at different rates. So not everybody is all that susceptible to hypnosis. Remember that you can't be hypnotized to do anything against your will. Um, hypnosis does not improve our memory. Um, it might even kind of like mess with our memories. So we should kind of remember that when we talk about um, hypnosis being able, or hypnotists being able to um, recover memories or things like that, typically those aren't going to really be accurate, no matter how much, you know, you might hear about that in society. Um, we do know that hypnosis works well for some people for pain, and we believe that that's due to dissociation or splitting our consciousness. So let's look at three theories of hypnosis. Um, we have the divided consciousness theory, which suggests that dissociation occurs during hypnosis. So a split in our consciousness, which means that part of the person is unaware of what's occurring, but another part is aware. Um, that part that would be aware is called the hidden observer, and that would be Ernest Hilgard, and he used that term to describe our awareness of our experiences, like pain, but that we wouldn't be able to report while we're hypnotized. Um, there's also the social influence theory of hypnosis, and during that, they believe that the subject is playing um, the role of a good subject. So we know that in terms of like social expectations and social pressures that sometimes we feel the pressure to just go along. This doesn't mean that they're faking it, okay, or that they're pretending. It just means that you're playing a role, you're conforming, you're obeying. Um, and again, when we learn about uh, social psych, we kind of learned about those things. So um, you can just kind of, I guess, take a look at this diagram from your book. I think that it goes through um, that ice bath experiment quite well. So um, that's really it for hypnosis. We're going to jump into drugs and consciousness. So some basic definitions are at the top with tolerance, withdrawal. So you should know those. Differentiating physical from psychological dependence. Um, a physiological need for a drug, so unpleasant withdrawal symptoms like migraines and vomiting and things like that, that's physical withdrawal. Psychological dependence is exactly that. It's your psychological need to use a drug. So like, oh, I'm stressed out, so I just really need to smoke or I really need to drink or do things like that. That's a psychological dependence. So psychoactive drugs fall into different categories. Um, depressants, stimulants, hallucinogens, those are our different categories of drugs. You should know the category in general and then know the drugs that would fall under that. So depressants are drugs that reduce neural activity. Examples would be alcohol, barbiturates, and opiates. Um, alcohol disrupts our memory, reduces our self-awareness and our self-control, and slows our body functions. Barbiturates are tranquilizers. They typically mimic, mimic um, alcohol's effects, and they're used for sleep and anxiety. They depress the activity of the CNS, and they can be lethal if we combine them with alcohol. And then opiates would be opium and its derivatives like morphine and heroin. Those are things that you could be given for pain. Highly addictive. Remember that those are some of the things that um, you would even take like in a doctor's office or for like getting your teeth pulled or any of those things. Um, stimulants then would be another drug category and they excite our neural, neural to activity and they speed up our body function. So examples of those would be methamphetamines, ecstasy, cocaine, and then caffeine, nicotine. Um, I didn't really give you examples of those because I think you know what those do. Um, in terms of methamphetamine, that's going to trigger the release of dopamine, which stimulates our brain cells. It enhances our energy and our mood. It lasts about eight hours or longer. Um, over time, we can really get permanent neural damage, reduce dopamine levels, and they're highly addictive. Um, so we've seen pictures of like what happens if you're on meth, and it doesn't even take that long. Ecstasy then, also referred to as MDMA, is a synthetic stimulant and a mild hallucinogen at the same time. It produces a short euphoria. Um, it harms serotonin-producing neurons, causing long-term damage in mood and even like our thinking. 
Cocaine then will give a rush of euphoria that depletes the brain supply of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Typically lasts 15 to 30 minutes, and then you're going to get a, a crash right after that. And the crash usually brings in low levels of depression and as those effects wear off. Another category would be hallucinogens, um, and that would be a psychedelic or mind-altering type of drug like LSD or marijuana. It typically distorts our perceptions and might evoke sensory images in the absent of, absence of sensory input, so hallucinations, which you've already learned about. THC, just as a side note, is the active ingredient in marijuana. Um, also with hallucinogens, you might, people report like a near-death experience, which is an altered state of consciousness that's typically reported um, after like a close brush with death. So again, similar to drug-induced hallucinations. Um, I just included a couple terms here, monism and dualism, that you guys can take a look at. Just a few more terms um, would be agonist and antagonist, which, you know, we learn about in the, the neural unit. But an agonist is a drug that mimics the effects of neurotransmitters. So all of these drugs we've talked about could, you know, some of those drugs might fall into that category, or they would fall into the antagonist category, which is dr a drug that blocks neurotransmitters. We also know that drugs can act as reuptake inhibitors, so that means they act on the opposite end of the neuron. So that falls into, like I said, that neural unit more so. Different levels of consciousness um, that we might talk about, which I cover in personality, but that I'll just remind you of here. The word conscious would be information that is currently the subject of our attention. Preconscious is information not being attended to, but it can come back into our mind if I just like say, hey, what did you do last weekend? Subconscious is information that we're not aware of, but that does exist and affects us. Nonconscious would be body processes um, controlled by our mind, but that we're not attending to in any way. And then unconscious would be cognitive activity outside of our awareness. So just a few overall terms that, like I said, I talked about in personality, but since this is states of consciousness, I just want to go over there. Um, so that's it for this uh, material.